Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. I'm here to ask and answer one simple question. WTF is King's Quest. It's not something I thought I'd ever be saying in my lifetime, funnily enough, but there we go. As it turns out, we did manage to live long enough to see another King's Quest game. The question is, of course, is it any good? That's a risky thing, isn't it? You know, I never played any of the original King's Quest, so please bear in mind this is the perspective that this video is coming from. I didn't play any of them. Even if I did have a PC at the time that those came out, which I didn't, then I imagine that I wouldn't have picked them up in the first place because they were a weird hodgepodge of point and click and old school adventure style titles. They're not the sort of thing that I would have been potentially into. The series spanned a great number of games and they even shifted genres and mechanics as they went through. But this is an episodic series brought to you by the odd gentlemen who are responsible for the misadventures of PB Winterbottom. Not exactly the lengthiest and most prestigious resume, but we'll take what we got. Alright, I'll have a quick look at the options menu because there is not much to see here at all. Full screen on or off, texture quality, high, medium and low. V-Sync on or off, resolution options available. Sliders for music and sound effects volume, but inexplicably no slider for speech volume, which is a huge deal because there's a lot of voice acting in this game. It's in fact one of the highlights, so don't really know what's going on with that. There's one key thing from this that's missing. I'm not going to fuss too much about the graphics of what is essentially a point-and-click-ish sort of game, but this game really, really could use anti-aliasing. An inbuilt anti-aliasing option. Of course, you can force it, you can inject AA in other ways, but it would be nice to have it. And the main reason is the subtitles look really, really aliased. They look nasty and pixely. In fact, some details in the game could really do with a bit of smoothing around the edges, so I'm not really sure why that's missing, but it is a big deal, as you will see for the subtitles. Outside of that, you do have some gameplay options here. Controller, vibration, mouse sensitivity. No key rebinding, but the game doesn't use keys in the first place, as you can see with the exception of the movement keys and use right there. Now you have QWERTY and AZERTY. Now, yeah, okay, these are very common. I'm not gonna... Lay on it too much for not having rebindable keys here, but still, oh, still, you could, you could maybe let people do that. That would be nice, you know, for for left-handed people in particular, it can be a bit of a pain in the ass. They maybe would prefer to use cursor keys instead. Just, just mentioning that as a possibility, it would be good to have. Okay. Let's jump into this. So I have to estimate that I'm probably about two and a half hours or so into the game. My Steam counter is completely wrong. It's claimed I've played, played six. I know that's not right at all. I know I did have to alt-tab for quite some time in the middle of that. So let's jump in and see what we have to see. Chapter one, A Night to Remember. This is going to be a five-chapter game. This is the first chapter, of course, that's currently available. And here we are. Whisper! Hmm. Ooh. Whisper can do it. The voice acting in this game is absolutely fantastic. It's really, really good. And it helps that the writing is good as well. This is going to be a bit of a weird video, I think, because there are a lot of parts of me that want to turn around and tell you that mechanically this game is subpar in many ways. The first hour or so of the game in particular exhibits some of the worst aspects of action sequences in older adventure games and QTEs, things like Dragon's Lair. It's got elements of that in it. But... Watch your step, kid. Oh, thanks. I know it ain't fancy, but it'll have to work for now. Amaya Blackstone, nice to meet you. Graham, the pleasure's mine. It's nice to see all these bridges are getting fixed. All these bridges? No, kid. This contract is over. Daventry can't afford me anymore. They can't even afford oil for the crumbler over there. My own invention, of course. Oh, what does a crumbler do? It lifts, it chops, it crumbles. Most importantly, it brings in the monies which are desperately needed. Been kind of rough around here lately. It seems that way. Daventry's been an interesting experience so far. Different from what I read in my travel books. Honestly, I'm starting to wonder if it's for me. Don't worry, kid. It's not you. This kingdom's been going downhill ever since the Queen died. And now, with the bridges out, no one can get into Daventry. It's really quiet. I hate the silence. I'm a woman of action, if you couldn't tell. Quiet towns don't pay the bills. I can see that. Well, I should get going. 
Perhaps someone's wandered into my shop. If you make it there, come say hi. I'm on the left. All right. Okay, so I will be talking over the rest of the voice acting. I apologize for that in advance, but there's going to be quite a lot of it. Oh, yeah, that, that first hour, it's a wild mix of different things. I mean, for instance, there are a few QTEs, there are a couple of instant death sequences, there are a few puzzles which require using items, a little bit of basic point and click. There's a little bit of basic platforming. There's even a little bit of basic archery, which is actually surprisingly competent. The game is controlled with W, A, S, and D, and you can move around like this. So it's not a traditional point and click, although it does maintain some sort of link to the old point and clicks of the past. It actually reminds me a little bit of Telltale's older stuff before they went full narrative when they were doing things like Sam and Max. And they had elements of point and clicks in there. It's a little bit like that, because they absolutely do have elements of point-and-click adventures in this game. I mean, you have an inventory, you use item with this. There's quite a lot of backtracking, for instance. There's a decent amount of conversation. There are puzzles which involve talking to people and figuring out ideas and doing little quizzes. There are puzzles which involve using this with that. Currently, I have one coin to my name. This is the inventory with five slots. You hit the tab button to hit that, and that is about it. And a lot of it involves just exploring, trying to find items, and trying to figure out exactly what's going on. And this will involve quite a lot of traipsing around the place, and the game does lack a map, which is a little bit irritating, especially considering it has shifting perspectives a lot of the time. It's not consistent in that regard. Now I'm being murdered by squirrels, evidently. Far too many squirrels. too many squirrels. So that's the sort of mixture that you'll get when it comes to the mechanics. And it would be very, very easy to criticize a lot of them. For instance, the QTEs. A lot of people just don't like QTEs. I personally think that when used sparingly, they're reasonable. It's a good way to replace a more complex mechanical system that a game maybe doesn't necessarily need. You know, you want an occasional action sequence, so you do a QTE instead of actually building a full fighting system in and so on and so forth. You get the idea. And it doesn't really seem to overdo it too much. There's a little bit of very basic platforming that is very, very easy to execute. I mean, the, the controls are not that hard to master. They might be a bit clumsy. I'd certainly agree with that, but I don't think they're hard to master. The game starts off with no tutorial whatsoever, and it's like, hey, solve this little puzzle. I mean, I solved it in about 20 seconds. It wasn't really that difficult to figure out what you had to do. You just had to hit space on a couple of things. So it's not really a problem that the game doesn't have a tutorial. It's not like they have all that many complex mechanics in the first place to explain. But it would be easy to pick apart the individual elements of the game. Absolutely. You could say, well, the platforming isn't particularly good. Yeah, I get that. You know, it's essentially eight directional platforming for the most part usually about crossing rivers. You jump to a rock and then you hold forward and then either Q or E to sort of angle left to the right and then you jump and so on and so forth. Basic. Very basic. The archery is very basic. It works. You know, it's mouse controlled. You shoot a thing with a bow. That's about it. It's all, it's all functional. You know, there's no speedy answers that you have to give a, a la, say, a telltale game to a conversation. And the point and click stuff is essentially rub X on Y as it would be for most point and clicks. So, it would be really, really easy, wouldn't it, to criticize the game by breaking it down to those core elements. But if you did that, I feel you would be missing the point. Because there's something kind of magical about this game. That sounds cliched and awful and overly emotional and f quite frankly disingenuous, doesn't it? But somehow, this game has kept me playing, and it's really quite enchanting in many ways, and I'd like to try and identify why I believe that is. Firstly, the writing. It's, for the most part, spot on. We're in a little bit of a lull at the moment, but the writing is usually on point. It's snappy, it's witty, it's genuinely funny. It's very Python-esque in many ways. There's a lot of bumbling around. You are essentially a plucky but incompetent hero, who somehow managed to fumble his way through to success. And the story is being told in a very Princess Bride-esque way with this character grown up to the point where he's a grandfather telling it, I believe, to his either his niece or his granddaughter. And 
I mean, you could. That's exactly what it is right there. So that works really, really well because it's very well written, and the voice cast for this game is spot on. I do believe there's actually a character from The Princess Bride in this, and if that's not the case, that's a very good impersonator. Armin Shimmerman, also known as Quark from DS9, I'm fairly sure plays the mini knight. He, and he does a spot on job. I mean, hell, if you want to remind people of The Princess Bride, then perhaps, perhaps you should use a character from The Princess Bride. And it works! It really, really does. And that is surprising. The writing pretty much across the boards is great. I mean, there are some voice talents that are maybe not as fantastic as others, but for the most part, they're awesome. I love the main character. This whole thing reminds me of Disney Pixar movie in the way that it's presented. The writing's great. It's appealing to, I think, people of my age, which I think is to be expected. I mean, why, why would you not want to do that? If you happen to, say, be making a King's Quest game, you know, that's the age range you're looking to tap, isn't it? And it is appealing, and I think it is witty, and it's very enjoyable, and it's got plenty of grins. It's made, you know, the writing makes me happy. Uh, I'm, I'm not getting sick of it. I'm actually looking forward to the next line. That's very rare for me. You know, I'm not really a story-focused gamer. You've got to write pretty damn well to impress me. And in my opinion, this game does a spot-on job of that. Presentation's not too bad either, you know, there are some elements that are really nicely done. The animations in particular on the main character. You may have noticed that the cloak waves and wafts around in the wind, it, and it looks really quite good. But it's not just that. The, the, the actual animation in the cutscenes is very, very good as well. And it's comedic in many, many ways, and the timing's good. But there's one thing that I think a lot of people have not mentioned. And a lot of people don't mention this in games because a soundtrack to a game is often something you just have on in the background and something that maybe, perhaps, you turn off and listen to your own music. You shouldn't in this game. Not in King's Quest. This has got some of the finest example of musical scoring that I've ever had the pleasure to listen to. And the reason is because they have scored the music almost perfectly to the action. And that's what reminds me really of Disney Pixar movies, and indeed old Disney movies. It uses old but tried and true techniques. It's not just music that's in the background. They are specifically timing it. They're writing the music to fit the scene, and it's impeccably good. Impeccably good almost all the time. It's really, really good, guys. I mean, it's just unbelievable. It's a shame we don't have an action sequence going on here because that would be absolutely ideal. I mean, you know, this is this is nice sort of wander around the town yes, sort of music, that. absolutely. It's, uh, got any free samples? But it's the action sequences that really got me, and I think that's that's what got me through the first hour in particular. Yeah, okay, it, it was janky in many ways, and the mechanics were not very well fleshed out, but. I really did feel like I was going through an action sequence in a movie. Usually I don't really like that, but that scoring was so good. The animations were so great, and there was a lot of tender loving care, I think, applied to that sequence, even if it's not especially advanced, and I think you could argue that it's it's very simplistic and a bit of a waste of time. Speaking of waste of time, I'm not gonna wax lyrical about how incredible this game is for the entire video because there are definitely some issues, there's no doubt about that. And I think one of the issues that you could objectively criticize rather than complain about subjectively is the fact that you have to repeat cutscenes and spoken sequences and there's no way to skip through them at all, even if you've seen them multiple times. And it's very easy to potentially you know, hit the space button again and go into another sequence where he's talking and talking and talking about that whatever item it was that he found on the ground. This is particularly true when you die. You can die in this game, and the deaths are unfair. There's no doubt. They're obviously a callback to the old King's Quest games. In particular, I think there's three or four separate sequences, maybe even five, in the first hour where you can die in the sort of Dragon's Tunnel. And... You know, I'm going to let them get away with it because the deaths are very amusing. They do a very Prince of Persia-esque thing where the narrator explains this thing away. You know, for instance, I think the first time when you can die is by pulling the wrong switch. Now, you look at that objectively, you say, that's bad game design, that's unfair, you would have no idea. 
In reality, you absolutely do. If you look at the environmental clues, you can clearly tell which switch it is. But it, it puts you right back there. And it's not really a problem. And it's amusing. It's funny. And the narrator explains it away and the animation is really good. So I can let it get away with it. What I can't let it get away with is spawning you right back before an unskippable cutscene. Don't do that. Do not do that. Stop it. Stop it. That really ruins it. You know, if you want a cohesive nar narrative experience, the last thing you want is the game repeating itself, right? And that's something you need to avoid. Now, subjectively, I think it will be extremely easy for people to criticize this game on the basis that there's a lot of backtracking. There is. Uh, absolutely. There's go to this area, grab this item. Oh, you got to run all the way back there. Now, and occasionally it will allow you to use a shortcut, but for the most point, part, you sort of, you very slowly hobble through sequences. And yeah, it wastes a little bit of time. Is backtracking inherently a bad thing? Is it in fact necessary in a game that's essentially, for all intents and purposes, a point and click? You know, you're not pointing and clicking, but you are moving around. I mean, the best way to describe it is kind of, to some degree anyway, is a bit of a simplified Grim Fandango, I think. Uh, you, you move around with the keyboard, and it would probably work a little bit better with the controller, but I really never had any problems with the controls. It's fine, you know, it's, it's not optimal, but I don't think you'll ever have keyboard control be optimal for a game with this sort of perspective. It's very difficult to do that. But it is a fairly simple point and click. And there's been, for the most part, some reasonable puzzles. And I like the fact that the... Is the term lampshading? I think maybe... No. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Anyway. The game makes a little bit of meta-commentary. When you get a hatchet, for instance, the first thing that your granddaughter's like, So you went around and chopping down everything? I'd say, no, 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 it's not that type of story. I wouldn't go around using this item on everything. That would be ridiculous. Which is, of course, a little bit of a throwback and says, yeah... It, uh, point and clicks will often rub X on Y until Z happens. Very, very, very true. No doubt. And that's charming. I hope they don't overdo that. Because we are breaking the fourth wall and saying, Hey guys, it's a video game. Isn't that hilarious and edgy? Doesn't work if you keep doing it unless your name is Deadpool. But I think that this game does it at least a reasonable amount. Now, presentation-wise, as I said, I, I mean, graphically it's not amazing, but... I think that it, it does work relatively well. I, th th I think they can dodge a lot of the poor quality textures through deliberate camera panning. You have really no control of your own camera panning, so the game deliberately avoids showing you objects up close. It's like, because we know that table's low resolution, and we know those objects in the back are uh, you know, low polygon count, but still, it does end up being reasonable as a result. They, they do a good job of obfuscating that. The one thing they don't do a jo good job of obfuscating is the fairly poor quality lip syncing, which is a bit of a shame. I mean, it's more than a bit of a shame. Uh, that's the sort of thing that I really hope they improve for the next chapter, because with voice acting that good, and with a script that well written, the last thing you want is poor quality voice acting to draw you out of the experience. And uh, poor quality lip syncing, sorry, not voice acting. I don't know where the hell I'm going with this. You don't want that. And unfortunately, the game's lip syncing, it looks a little bit out of date, I have to admit. You know, there are elements of the game that certainly do look out of date. But from someone that really didn't know what to expect going into this, having not played any of the other King's Quest games, and not being a great fan of point-and-click adventures, I have been surprisingly enchanted by the story, the voice acting, the world, and of course the music. Uh, this really seems like a product from people that knew what they were doing, and really wanted to try very, very hard to create a modern King's Quest experience with a few throwbacks here and there. I don't mind the occasional QTEs. I don't mind the occasional little silly action sequences that maybe are a little bit clumsy, but they're not frustrating. It's entirely possible that later on in the game and the other chapters that will happen. We never know. You know, the usual caveat applies with episodic games. But it is really quite surprising to me that I enjoyed this. Great writing awesome music, fantastic cast of characters, wonderfully whimsical. That's the sort of ways that I would describe something like King's Quest. There is obviously the risk that you will wander around aimlessly. It happens. It definitely does, especially for me, who is utterly hopeless when it comes to point-and-click adventures and figuring out exactly what's going on. And the lack of map is a little bit crippling in many ways. The game also lacks fast travel, which could be somewhat useful, I think. One bell That's a bell? Okay. Fair enough. But despite its flaws, 
I'm actually very surprised by King's Quest, A Night to Remember. Actually, this is a really, really good start. And you know what? It sort of fills in the gap that Telltale abandoned. You know, Telltale were dominant in this sort of genre for a while. They moved away from point and clicks, and this game is a point and click in many ways, towards this is a narratively driven QTE experience where you wander around a lot. King's Quest is a bit more of a throwback to old style point and clicks. It is not an old school, old school point and click, but that element is certainly there. No doubt about that. And you know what? It's quite charming, actually. Surprisingly so. I would like to like to finish it. So, consider that a recommendation, I suppose. Of some description. King's Quest, ladies and gentlemen. The first episode is available for $10 or your regional equivalent. And you can pick up all five episodes currently for $30 or your regional equivalent. My name has been Total Biscuit. Thank you very much for watching. And I'll see you next time.